The game is over. The Rebels have won. Yeah! March 1994 saw Fergus McCann finally take over Celtic in a long drawn out battle which had gone on for several years. Paving the way for Fergus however were thousands of regular Celtic fans who had expressed their concerns about the old board. We've spoken already to Mark McGlone from Celts for Change but the precursor to that group was a group called Save Our Celts which was created a full three, three years prior to the takeover in early 1991. On that note, I'm delighted to be joined today by Jim Orr, a man who attended the group's inaugural meeting before going on to play his own part in the months and years that followed. Jim, we're marking 30 years since Fergus took over, but it's actually now over 33 years since you and others put the wheels in motion with the Save Our Celts campaign. Are the memories of those times still as vivid? Yeah, uh, the, the main reason for that is I've, I've just written a play which uh, covers that period and uh, maybe talk about that later on. So did a lot of research last year to refresh my memory as to what happened and uh, yeah, having done the research again, uh, yeah, I'm uh, 33 years ago, yeah, a long time. Yeah, was there um, mixed emotions when doing the research and just kind of revisiting those times? No, I mean, uh, the play's a comedy, so it has to be funny, it has to tell the scene, it has to tell the story, it has to be factual. And the fact that I've written a few Celtic plays before, but this is one because I was involved mm -hmm. at the time uh, and I knew all the kind of wee bits and pieces that were behind it because, uh, I mean, the story itself, uh, leading up to the takeover, I mean, you could, you could go back a few decades for that in, in terms of uh, where things really started. And and older Celtic supporters, even older than me, would, 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 would go back to the 50s and, and talk about how terrible the board were and how they let players go and people like Paddy Creran and Bobby Collins and... Before Jock Steen came, Billy McNeil was about to go to Spurs and what have you, you know, and the board picked the team. And, and so uh, you can get back a long time to talk about the Celtic board. But for me, in, in terms of putting the play uh, together, uh, I thought things actually started uh, back in 1971 uh, with the Ibrox disaster, where uh, 66 people tragically lost their life uh, at, the, at the Rangers Celtic game on New Year's Day. Because what happened thereafter was that the Rangers manager, Willie Waddle, said, that's not going to happen again. Uh, and how are you going to do with that? We're going to build an all-city stadium. So for young guys like yourself, you know, who never experienced uh, a terracing uh, back in the day, uh, it was pretty basic. Uh, I go and see Paul Juniors now and again, and I've mm. been up with St Rocks a couple of times. Imagine that times ten. That's that's what an old terracing looked like. You know that you stood on the terrace and you were standing in broken concrete and mud. Uh, the toilet facilities were non-existent. A big ball, big 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 wall at the back of the terracing. You know. That was the ladies. So, you know, very, very... So they're, they're going to build an all season stadium. So you couldn't conceive what that would be like. And they did it within 10 years. So, you know, hats off to them. Multicoloured stadium. It wasn't red, white and blue. It was browns and yellows and whatever. It just... It was like a space age thing. You couldn't believe it. And at the time, the, the joke was there was a fundamental flaw in the stadium which was facing the park because they were so bad at the time. Because at that time, people again can't conceive the fact that the main three teams in Scotland were Celtic, Aberdeen and Dundee United. Mm -hmm. The Rangers were poor fourth. But they've got an all-seated stadium and we don't. And the Celtic board will say, well, Celtic fans like to stand, so we're not bothered at the end of the day. But that was significant in years to come. And if you fast forward to the end of the 80s, uh, April 89, the Hillsborough disaster, uh, that's the next big event, I think, that kind of forms what happens in years to come. Uh, 97 people tragically losing their lives. At Sheffield Wednesday ground, but it wasn't Sheffield Wednesday saying, well, we're not going to make sure that happens again. The government stepped in, for those uh, younger listeners. The government stepped in and said, that's not going to happen again in top flight football in the UK. So every club has to have an all-seated stadium and we'll give you four and a half years to do it. So that was like January 1994. Mm -hmm. uh, January 1990, sorry. So you've got to August 94 to build this new stadium. And that, that time, 1990, we were starting to into the shadow of uh, our main rivals across the river. Uh, a couple of months after, Hillsborough was the Morris Johnson affair. Uh, and I'm sure every Celtic fans know about what happened to Morris Johnson. But just to refresh your memory, the issue there was the fact that we had signed them and we had a legally binding document and UEFA were happy with that. And two months later, uh, it turns up at Ibrox. You can't imagine, you know, we talk about the banter year of in the last, you know, since since they went bust. But that was the start of the banter years on the opposite side of the fence. Because mm -hmm. imagine 
walking into Parkheads and taking Morris Johnson away. Because in 1989, in 1989, sorry, Morris Johnson was in the top 10 strikers in Europe. Unbelievable. What a player. And the rumour on the seat is Charlie Nick was coming back. So we'd peak Morris Johnson and just past his peak Charlie Nick. They'd have scored 50 goals a season. Not a problem. And nine in a row would have never happened. But Morris Johnson got to them. Our board have sat back. Our board have sat back and watched that. Watched them wander across and take Morris Johnson. Not any other. So the story's about, you know, them signing a player of a certain religion. Yeah, that was huge. But from a Celtic point of view, how have you let that happen? How could you possibly let that happen? Binding contracts. We had a small, uh, small mentality board before. We were a bit of a corner shop compared to across the river. We had David Murray, Thatcherite, no Mason, borrowing money right, left and centre, investing, bullish. We're going to win things. And we had a group of directors who were there because of their families. Basically, they were given shares from uncles and grandfathers and fathers and mothers. And the thing about family business is there's no guarantee that when you hand your shares down to the next in line that they're going to be any good. And they were, I mean, they were, they were died in the real Celtic men. You have to say that up front. But does that qualify you to run a company? And at the time, we were turning over something like £7 million. Tom's happening compared to today's uh, finances. And we were losing money and we had a bank overdraft. The centenary season happened two seasons before that, 1988. And up to that point, Celtic had never into debt. And in the centenary season, they, they built the new facade outside Celtic Park and they kind of tried to compete with Rangers by the Machiavellis and the Joe Millers of this world. And all of a sudden, they were buying a couple of million quid, which doesn't sound a lot in current days numbers, but it was a lot back then. Mm. So they're in debt by a couple of million quid. Uh, we win the double. Then Rangers win the league the following season. Uh, we win the cup with the Joe Miller. Cup final, too young to remember that? Do you know? Absolutely uh, not. No, it's okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, okay. Gary uh, Stevens pass back, Joe Miller. You're younger than you look. Young yeah. man. Young man. I also stood on terraces, Jim, at the Celtic end. I'm certainly not as young as you. Really? <laughs> well, this is how long, how young, just how young is this young man? Yeah. So, uh, win the cup, and then we'll sign Morris Johnson, and it'll be happy days, and then we'll lose Morris Johnson. Mm. So they go in and win what is going to be the first of nine in a row. Nobody's talking about nine in a row back then. That's just, you know, because. What tended to happen when Celtic did the nine in the 70s is that they won a few leagues, we won a few leagues, and that's the kind of circle of life. And I think that's what the Celtic board thought. Well, they're having their day in the sun. Mm -hmm. We'll have our day in the sun. But then Taylor comes out in January 1990, and that's and that's a game changer. Because not only do they owe the bank money, not only are they struggling to buy players, they're getting dwarfed by, which is like, 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 like in a supermarket, to the corner shop, comparison they are struggling badly so that's kind of like self-fulfilling because you've got less money you're buying poorer quality players you're not winning the league you're not not winning the league by being second you've been third fourth fifth and that's how bad it was then and there was no future in it so as a supporter so it was something has to change something must, something must change but what do you do now we're sitting doing a podcast today we've got social media we've got internet we didn't have that stuff back in 1990 so you do two things. Either you, you phone Radio Clyde phone in or you write to the papers. And and I can have done both, but you knew it would be have no effect at all. You know, we article in the paper, Jim or this is terrible, Morris Johnson, what's this about? Phoning Radio Clyde. Something has to change and nothing changes. But then as a reaction to the Taylor report in April nineteen ninety, Celtic co opted Brian Dempsey and Michael Kelly onto the board. Michael Kelly being one of the Kellys, Brian Dempsey being nothing to do with the families. Self-made millionaire, entrepreneur, uh, uh, had a number of uh, different properties, dealt in properties. He's the guy that's going to solve the Taylor problem. So Brian comes on in April uh, 1990. And if you fast forward to something like October 1990, um, we've qualified... Uh, for the League Cup final uh, against Rangers. And at the time, uh, I've got a season ticket and, and I've got a brilliant season ticket. I'm in the stand. There's only 6,000 season ticket holders then, 4,000 for the stand, 2,000 for the ground. And I'm in the stand and I'm like 10 for the director's box. This is position A. This is brilliant. Now, back in the day, I mean, most games were cash only. You know, there were very few all tickets. You, you remember it now, you're, you're not as young as I thought you were. <laughs> uh, and 
youngsters can't get their heads around that. Can't get their heads on the fact that you know you could be sitting in a pub talking to your mate back in 1988 and about to go to the game, and a pal could come up and say, "Who are you playing today? Aberdeen. I'll go as well. Uh-huh. Just jump in the car and let's go." Because nowadays it's, it's season tickets, it's sellouts, you know. So people don't understand how things worked back in the day. So I've got a season ticket. So the cup finals all ticket. So and how do you find out who's getting tickets? You need to buy the Celtic View. And nobody buys the Celtic View unless you need to buy tickets. So so you get the Celtic View. Uh, who's getting tickets for the cup final? Right. Season ticket was, an allocation of 25,000. 25,000 for the cup final against Rangers. And you get the Celtic View. And it says uh, the, the, the following qualify for cup final tickets. Season ticket holders numbers one to three thousand. Right, and you're looking at this thinking, and I'm something like 3,800. <laughs> thinking, what? What do you mean? I just can't be right. So, so I write to Jack McGinn, who I think was the, was, the, was the chairman at the time, and I sent him a cheque for 12 quid because it was six quid a t- ticket, and I've got a mate who's a season ticket. And I said, Look, it's a bit, you know, I said, uh, season ticket holders, uh, you know, this is, this is nonsense. I've enclosed a cheque for two tickets. Please, thank you. You can do it. And it was a nice letter, it wasn't like pointing mm-hmm. the fingers. And they sent me this ridiculous letter back talking about, well, you know, what can we do? We've only got 25,000 tickets. What about the fans in Ireland? What about the fans in England? What about so? Because it was all kind of supporters club driven back in the day. Couldn't mm-hmm. keep, they didn't want season ticket holders. They were just, you know, they kept demanding things like cup final tickets. So I sent him another letter and I said, how can you possibly say that? And then he sent my cheque back again. So I'm thinking, this is dead annoying. And I thought, oh, Michael Kelly and Brian Dempsey, they've, they've joined the board. They'll be, they'll be modern thinkers. I want to write to them. So I write to them, care of Celtic Park. So Michael Kelly comes back. I send him a cheque for 12 quid. Michael Kelly comes back and he says, uh, I'm just recently on the board. I'm just getting to grips with how things work. It's difficult. It's always a challenge with these cup finals, whatever. I've not got my allocation. He said, you make some good points here, Jim. I've, I've not got my allocation yet, but I'll hang on to your cheque and if I get the next allocation, I'll send you a couple of tickets. And I thought, Michael Kelly, what a guy. I love him. He's the good. The saviour. I'm going to the cup final, hopefully. But nothing came for Dempsey for about a week or so, and I'm thinking, ah, it's this new guy, Dempsey, rubbish. So a letter comes in for Dempsey, and open the letter from Dempsey, and the cheque falls out, and I think, ah, he's a, he's a Jack McGinn, him. And it's a two page letter, and he starts off with something along the lines of, you make very good points here, excellent points from a customer service point of view. Here's my home phone number, give me a call after the cup final, and we can talk about some of the things that you've that you're, that you're, that you're, that you're raised here. I'm thinking, I've got Brian Dempsey's home phone number, this is good. And then he says, hey, I've not got my allocation yet, like Michael Kelly, but once I get it, I will send you two tickets for my compliments and return your cheque. Okay. And you're thinking, uh, I'm going to marry this guy. <laughs> so that's, he's the man. I'm going to, that's that. He's going to save Celtic. Without the word <coughs> save ourselves before. What a guy. So, cut final comes out, and Michael Kelly sends me two tickets, and Brian Dempsey sends me two tickets. And because I was desperate to go to the cut final, I'd always had irons in the fire, and end up with something like 10 tickets for the cut final. And I knew the guys were in the boat me, didn't they? Cup final tickets. So I phoned Celtic Park and asked, could I have their phone numbers? So data protection wasn't a thing back then. Uh-huh. And I get their numbers. And I said, look, I've got all these tickets for the cup final. Meet me for it. And so I'm, I'm giving out tickets like Robin Hood, basically. So I'm thinking, this is, so this is me, individual fan, thinking Dempsey and Kelly, good guys. And then what used to be the case, the Scott Sport used to be on a Friday night. And again, that's where you get your information from, Scott Sport, Radio Clyde, whatever. So... And Brian Dempsey had the idea, we're going to move, we could potentially move to Rob Royston. Yeah. He's got land up there. And the way it was, it was kind of couched was that he's got land up there. It's your Celtic if you own it. If you don't own it, I'll sell it. I'll, I'll, build, I'll, I'll build houses on it. Not a problem. So I'm sitting waiting for Scott Sport to come on and I've got the sound down and wife's there reading and I'm maybe just waiting for him. Uh, and up pops a picture of Brian Dempsey. I'm saying to the wife, that's it, you're chucked to see him. That's, that's my man. We're going to live in Rob Royston and live happily ever after. Turns the sound up, sacked from the Celtic board. Sacked. And I'm thinking, oh, Don, he's my best pal. I've got his phone number. Oh, what do you mean he's sacked? And then as that unfolds and then we lose the cup final a couple of days later, I thought, well, I can't phone him now because <laughs> he's been sacked. What did I do here? So that was a tipping point. That was the point. You said, Morris Jones was, was ridiculous. Dempsey, who's came on, has only been there for, without knowing the backstory, here's a guy who's there to solve the problem of the stadium, which is a game changer, and you've got short of him after six months. And as the years go by, then you know what the real story is behind that, that Michael Kelly and Chris White didn't want him on the board. And that meeting 
it was meant to be ratifying him to go on the board. Mm -hmm. So he was never ratified. So from a <clears throat> from an, a, an embarrassment, that was total embarrassment. If you if you're Brian Dempsey, that's public humiliation, basically. And that's why I think that and I know Fergus gets all the credit. I get I look at it. Brian Dempsey for me was the guy that kept things bubbling along over mm -hmm. that period till they get to the point he stands in the steps and he says the game is over, the rebels have won. And quite right that he should say that. And again, like Fergus, lots of people would look at Brian Dempsey and think, oh, I don't really fancy him because of A, B and C. And everyone's got their faults. But but for me, Dempsey was the guy that kind of kept things going. So what happens next is that, again, he phoned me the old clay. This is terrible, Brian Dempsey. Phone. But then a few weeks later, I'm in the car coming back from uh, a game and I'm listening to Clyde and somebody comes on and says, I'm starting a campaign. I've had enough. That's it. You know, we need to do something about this. This is ridiculous. Brian Dempsey should have... He was the guy that was going to solve the problems. And I heard the guy's name was Willie Wilson, basically. So I got home and I phoned Clyde the next day and I said, uh, he's a caller on last night called Willie Wilson. He's an old school pal of mine. I lost touch with him to get his number. So data protection, as I said, wasn't a thing back then. So he gives me Willie Wilson's number and I phoned him and I said, Jim, Jim or, uh, I agree, everything you said there, something has to be done. I've got no idea what and neither did he, to be perfectly honest, but we need to do, do something, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. do something. So I met up with Willie and then what we said was, well, let's let's get other people involved in like the fanzines. So, so Jerry Dunbar, who started Not The View in late 1987, and that was groundbreaking, absolutely groundbreaking. Uh, Jerry Dunbar put a major part in all this stuff as well, because up to that point, you know, the only news you got, as I said earlier, was the Celtic View, and that was sanitised stuff. And here you have Not The View, and it's Pravda, putting stuff Pravda, about... I believe, is the... Pravda, and you've got Not The View, who's... It's, it's, it's kind of anti-board, that's having a go, it's, you know, the magazine for malcontents, and all that stuff. So, for people who like myself, we're getting more and more angry about how things were going. And and I couldn't see any way out for Celtic at all. I thought, you know, you know, as I said, at the time, nine in a row wasn't a thing. But at the time I was thinking, they can win as many leagues as they want. We will never touch them again. Do, do you think, Jim, just to pause you on that, do you think if the Taylor Report and the all seat requirement hadn't come in, the, the Celtic board would have just kicked everything into the long grass correct, correct. and just gone on... Correct. I think, I mean, in a, in, a, in, a, in a roundabout way, if it wasn't for the tail of the port, you'd be looking at whether it is now 35 in a row. Uh, because basically, that kind of saved, that, that, that had to lead to change. Uh, and I'll tell you why that had to lead to change. But in terms of, we get together and we have a meeting, ask a few mates along, Willie asks a few mates along, uh, Jerry Dunbar from Not The View, Brendan O'Hara, who's now an MP, he was involved in that as well. It's okay to say that. <laughs> uh, Joe Miller, average Joe Miller. So there's about maybe 15, 16 people are meeting. What do you do? What is it you do? And we said, well, take, well maybe you make up leaflets and, and we'll canvas people and see what they think. Because much as you think, we think it's a good idea, what I think of what you think could be two completely different things. So don't assume everyone thinks they're in the state that they're in. So we printed up something like five thousand leaflets and and the idea was we'll hand them out and we'll put a PO box and what we'll say is, you know, if you think something needs to be done, get back to us and what we'll try and do is we'll organise a public meeting. And if nobody get back to us and it's dead in the water straight D away. Tell you what we'll do, Jim. I've got the very flyer, an original flyer is this what I'm holding. Flyer. Indeed it is, you know. Yes. I'll get I'll get this framed up after, but we'll share it on the socials as well. But I'm going to read it out, right? So uh, A5 size flyer, save ourselves. Save Ourselves is a campaign set up by like-minded fans with the aim of gathering enough support to put pressure on the board of directors at Celtic Football Club and let them know in no uncertain terms that we, the fans, are no longer prepared to put up with their pathetic goings-on that have resulted in the downfall of our once great club. We feel the club can be saved, but only by the intervention of the fans. After all, it is our club, we are the lifeblood. If you think that if you think that you can help and want to be a part of our campaign, please write to us at Save Ourselves, PO Box 432. Uh, let us know your views and if you can close a stamped addressed envelope, we'll get back to you. Remember, the campaign has been set up by the fans, for the fans, and its success depends solely on the fans. So please give us your support. So these were handed out uh, by the likes of yourself, so these were all, and others. Those were all Willie Wilson's words. And as I said, you know, it's really Willie Wilson who should be here talking to you, but uh, lost touch with Willie. But yeah, so we do 5,000 of them and we, we, we can we can stay a wee bit away from Celtic Park. We don't know if we're going to get huckled by anyone handing out flyers. 
and the reaction was mixed as we kind of thought it would be. So for every one person who said, quite right, so on you go, the next person would say, get to, way back to Ibrox. You know, that kind of reaction, because as I said, that because you think something is the case, that's not everyone's view on things. And also the fact that uh, back then, the media were certainly looked upon as anti-Celtic. So if you're becoming anti-Celtic as well, then you're part of the problem, basically. So you shouldn't criticise Celtic, even though, you know what? They could win 35 in a row if we don't watch it here. So we hand out the flyers and we get about a couple of hundred people come back, which I thought at the time was rubbish, but people tell me not. It's actually really good to get that number of people coming back to you. So what happens next is we'll organise a meeting. And and that was my job. I was kind of, I suppose if there was a second in command, that was me. I'm an accountant and I say, well, I'll deal with any finance we've got or any organisation and We'll take it for there. And we decided the Shelton Town Hall's been close to Celtic Park. Yeah. We'll and, go there. And just before that, so that, that's kind of the big meeting. There's quite a lot of kind of coverage on that and Job Trammy, Brian Dempsey. We'll get yeah. to that in just a second. But actually the, the very first meeting, so I've, I've seen the detail on it. It's in a pub called, formerly Sun, called The Sundowners, Sundowners yeah. on Queen yeah. Street. Yeah. Now I said I was young, Jim, but I'm not that young. I, I don't remember that. It's pub. a cut-off point for, t- for Tino there. Okay, right, <laughs> so right. You can do your maths on that. But The Sundowners on Queen Street and yeah, a very small attendance by comparison could you tell us a wee bit just about that meeting yeah, in terms sure. of what went down there before so, the big one yeah so we, so we sit there and it's like again it's like we should do something what do you do <laughs> what do you do uh, so you have a chat around it and we say that we'll canvas some support have a public meeting invite speakers along to give their views and kind of like well known Celtic fans basically and somebody said well like, like Dempsey we want Dempsey and I said I've got his number <laughs> <laughs> I've got his number I'll give Brian a phone because he's like my best pal I've got my cup for him tickets mm-hmm. so uh, we decided to form a committee of five people at the time so Willie Wilson's uh, head guy myself a guy called Dave Ashman and a couple uh, Parliament Duncan Hart and his brother-in-law Brian Mullen so that was a, a kind of gang of five uh, but basically Willie I mean to do what Willie did was was phenomenal to put your head above the parapet you know I uh, said to you earlier before we uh, going on air that nobody knows who I am but they don't know who Willie Wilson was. And then latterly, they know who Matt McGlone was. And then both of them got a lot of stick. You know, so so I didn't get any stick because I'm in the background at the road. Uh, so we decide, this is what we'll do. Willie will be the spokesman. I'll be the kind of organiser at the back. Uh, kind of James Coburn, the Great Escape. And a guy called Dave Ashman would deal with the media because you're dealing with pre-social media, pre-internet, pre-technology, basically. So... If people send you a stamp, a stamp to death envelope for you young people out there is when you send somebody uh, a letter and put an envelope in it with a stamp on it so you can send it back to the person without having to pay for it. And so it's all labour intensive. And we started doing newsletters, which which, which I wrote, uh, the Independent Celt, tick. Basically, it's like an eight page thing. Just look what's been happening, who said what, what can we do next, what about season tickets? So it was, I mean, not like a fanzine, but basically just this is what we've been up to, this is what we're doing. And to send them to two or three hundred people, then we had to photocopy all of them and put them in envelopes. And so it was quite labour intensive. Uh, and and that's why we said stamp with just envelope, otherwise we'd have to pay for postage and what have you. Now, in the greater scheme of things, you might think, ah, oh, that's nothing. No, actually it is, because you're dealing with this ordinary punters who are giving up their time and having to do all this kind of extra work as well. Because all you want to do is do things as quickly as possible. So we have a committee of five and we have some names. Can we get these names? And the, the number one name is Brian Dempsey. So I phone him up then and get the chance to talk to Brian Dempsey. And I said, look, we're getting this meeting hopefully in the next you know month or so. We're looking for guest speakers. Would you be prepared to come along and speak? Because at that point in time, he'd been removed from the board two or three months and hadn't said a word to anyone. You know, and the, and the media were desperate to hear what he had to say. And he said, yeah, yes, I don't want an issue with that. I can't say certain things because they're, they're, they're confidential. And he said, well, why don't you come in and see me then and we can have a chat about it? Fine, well, that, that'd be great. So SL Holmes was the name of his company. And I told the guy, I said, uh, there's a, a, a small committee. Bring the lads in as well. That's fine, doing that. So, so we're all dead excited. We're going to see, see Brian Dempsey. So we see Brian Dempsey, SL Holmes one night. And a uh, charismatic man, uh, you know, brilliant guy. Uh, great speaker, just knows what to say, how to say it, mm-hmm. makes you feel at ease, all that kind of stuff. So he's given us kind of tea and biscuits and he says, eh, do you want to see the stadium? And you're thinking, well, what do you mean you want to see the stadium? So we go next door and he's got a kind of scale model of Rob Royce and what it's going to look like. It's sort of like the size of a snooker table, so it's like eight, eight by four. 
and he starts giving you facts about this. And suddenly it became real. Suddenly you think, well, obviously, does if you, you plan to do this, and he would say that, well, you know, the worst view you'll get will be like thirty meters behind the goals, and then we can evacuate the stadium in like one minute forty, and there'll be a train station built up there. And then he threw in this phrase, and I've said it a lot of times to people because it was just so bonkers. And he says, uh, and because of the way the stadium is is is, is situated, and, and situated, he says. Uh, the sun will never be in the goalkeeper's eyes. Right. <laughs> and people think that Brian Dempsey's quote is about, you know, the game is over. Yeah. That was mine. That was, over. and you're thinking, it's like a Chinese proverb, yeah. almost, when, when Pat Bourne is not going to wear a cap anymore. What do you mean? So the sun will never be in the goalkeeper's eyes. So that was my big takeaway from that. So Brian agrees to do it. We managed to get Jim Craig, you've got Elizabeth Lyon coming along. And what Brian also said was, he would ask the directors. We'd written to the directors. And Chris White, who is who was the major shareholder, says, you you just cause embarrassment. Mm-hmm. What's one not coming? I've got his quote, yeah. But Brian managed to convince Jimmy Farrell and Tom Grant to come along. They were supportive of him. On the understanding, they wouldn't say anything. They would just sit and observe it. They'd be on the stage there. And Jerry Dunbar agreed to come along as well. And Wally was going to speak. Again, that's, you know, ordinary working guy. They're going to stand up in front of hundreds of people. And we didn't know how much the media would be. I mean, STV were there, BBC were there, all the daily, all the tabloids, the Herald were there, Jim Trainer. All there taking photographs, it appeared in Scotland today, the next night it was on Scots, but it was the first thing you know, Brian Dempsey talked to. We went from nothing to this. Uh, but two weeks beforehand, we had uh, somebody to chair it, uh, a kind of well known football journalist, and then he kind of felt, I feel a bit uneasy in this because I can't really align myself to Celtic fans. So, and I said, well, I could chair it, I'd still be damn chairing it. We need to get somebody for this. And then, uh, and, and as fate would have it, the next day in the Herald, uh, there was a big letter from a guy called Joe Boltrami, who, for younger listeners in the 60s and the 70s, when anyone was accused of murder or, or robbing banks, the phrase was, get Boltrami, because he was this really famous defence lawyer. I think Donald Finlay, something a bit like that. I mean, he's about eight foot, big, massive guy. So, so I said, I look at Joe, Joe Boltrami. Oh, I, I deal. You phone him, Jim. Right, all right, I'll phone him. So in his letter it had like Beltrami and Company, West Nile Street, Glasgow. So like look up the phone book, find the phone number, phone Joe Beltrami. Hi, can I speak to Mr. Beltrami, who's calling? Jim Orr, what's the name of the company? <laughs> and I said save yourselves out loud for the first time. And I thought that sounds ridiculous. And she said, What? I said, it's a it's a kind of supporters campaign. If you tell Mr. Beltrami, it's a Celtic supporters campaign. And I'm thinking, this is dead in the water straight away. Hold on a second. And then this big booming voice comes on. Yes, Mr. Rob, we need to remove this board. This is unacceptable. They have to go. Come in and see me tomorrow, 9.30. Aye, all right. So I go and see Joe Bochami, again, larger than life character. And he's telling me his life story about how in the 1950s they did this and they did that. And his dad had an argument with them. And we'll, we'll show these people. So we had a chairman, basically. And then it's so in February sometime there in uh, 1991, uh, and it goes really well. Uh, Joe Bochami maybe spoke about it too much because he was just so enthusiastic. Wally Wilson was brilliant. As I said, imagine putting your head above the parapet, standing up there, the media there, you know, radio and TV, the newspapers rotating pictures, wanting to talk to him and stuff like that. That's just what I said to, to Matt. So we had Matt McGlone in last week and I asked the question of Matt, how did he, so there was also five on Celts for Change, so five guys save ourselves, five guys Celts for Change. How do you guys, as just regular guys, so you're saying you're, you're working your regular job as is Willie Wilson and the, re- the rest of the folks you mentioned there, how do you go from that to chairing a very important meeting, a meeting full of, well, Lisbon Lions, no less, you know, Jim Craig on the on the stage, and I think Jim had the support of maybe five other Lions, I think they'd voiced yeah. their, their concerns. Yeah. You've got Joe Boltrami, imposing figure, and you know, intimidating figures, you know, that kind of thing. You've got Celtic board members there, and you've got hundreds of people um, waiting on your every word about how you're somehow going to save Celtic, that cannot be easy for regular folks to just turn their hand to that. So how did likes of yourself and Willie and, and some of the other guys you mentioned there adjust to that side of things, Jim? It, it was it was only Willie. The rest of us in the background, nobody knows who we are. And all we're doing is kind of doing some of the donkey work. And, and he's putting himself forward every time. And before the meeting, you know, uh, STV, Jim Delahunt interviewed Brian Dempsey, interviewed Willie Wilson, interviewed Joe Boltrami. And and that was my first kind of experience of what's now become fake news. 
that thing because Jim Dale Hunt says to Joe Bochami is this the first step in the takeover and Bochami said nothing nothing to do with that at all mm-hmm. and, Dem- and Jim Dale Hunt said what's it about come to the meeting and listen carefully and you'll know what it's all about so in terms of that we're in the background uh, Dave Ashman's dealing with the media because basically he's, he's, he's phoning up he's faxing the Express and the record saying here's what Save Ourselves are doing mm-hmm. type of thing. and it was all about just trying to keep it current keep it within the media and Wally Speaks, brilliant, Jim Cray, Jed Dunbar, Joe Bultrami a wee bit too long, uh, and Brian Dempsey speaks for like 30 minutes without a script, and just just awesome, absolutely awesome, crowd in the palm of his hands, uh, interesting, factual, funny, the whole thing, you know, and he's one of these guys who, when he's telling a story, you're kind of, you're, you're hanging on his every word, and then he'll say something funny and he told a story, talked about, you know, Celtic and what Celtic means to everyone. And he said, family and friends that, you know, you go to weddings and funerals and anniversaries and birthday parties and the first thing you talk about is Celtic. It's all about Celtic. And you can leave all your problems and your troubles behind and talk about Celtic because they give you a whole lot of new problems to have. <laughs> and just, he was full of stuff like that and he talked about, you know, you know, do what you can, but do it with honour and do it. So he was, he was just standing ovation. What a guy! So that's in the papers the next few days. Uh, that's on the TV the next few days. What do you do next? Uh, don't know. How do you keep it going? Because you're making this up as you go along, basically. What is the mood of the crowd, right? So you've you've talked about Brian Dempsey and, and everyone that I've spoken to so far talks about how he just talented a, an orator he oh, he he is and was and brilliant. you know palm your hands all that kind of stuff. But you're speaking to a room of folk there, so 400 at the Shelton Town Hall. So maybe 350 went to that one. Something yeah, like that. Yeah. And they're not really knowing what to expect. And obviously, guys like Brian Dempsey and to an extent Joe Tram and others would certainly drum you up into a bit of a frenzy. But was it 350 odd folk that were wholeheartedly behind whatever you guys were looking to achieve, or were they there looking for info? Were they doubting what you were saying? What was the mood? I think I think the mood was mixed because no one knew what to expect including us, to be perfectly honest, because it's things like, I mean, you've got the kind of big stories, we so we had a meeting, but the smaller parts of that where, I mean, I got a phone call from some policeman saying, uh, I believe you've organised this meeting, have you got stewards? No, why do you, because there's 350 football fans coming, what are they be drinking? Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, it's my name on the lease, and right. I'm thinking, no, I don't want to let myself in. <laughs> so, you know, and I was saying to people uh, at the time that, uh, we had, a, we had a table on the stage and the janitor says, have you got a tablecloth? I said, no. So I go and get a tablecloth and it was on the telly. That's my claim to fame. My tablecloth's on the telly. So those were the wee things that kind of happened. So yeah. over the next wee while, you're thinking, what can we do to try and keep it, keep it valid? And then a, f- a few months later, I'm at work and somebody bought the sun at work. I'm not claiming to me it was me bought the sun. And in the back page, there's a headline and it's Jimmy Johnson saying, uh, Terry Cassidy will ruin Celtic. Because... Once Dempsey went, what they then did was they employed a guy called Terry Cassidy, uh, who was quite a kind of bullish character, a kind of north thing. But uh, people like Charles Green, that mm. kind of uh, doesn't stand any nonsense in people's faces. He wound everyone up. He wound, he wound Dempsey up straight away. He was saying, Brian Dempsey has to justify to me that a Celtic fan. You know, this is Brian Dempsey, who's got an executive box, who's been sponsoring Celtic for an umpteen number of years, and Cassidy's saying, you need to prove to me this. It's just, just terrible. And then... A few dollars in lines were doing hospitality and he binned them. Basically, he thought they were freeloaders. Away. And Jimmy Johnson was in the sun saying he will ruin Cassidy and put me and Terry Cassidy on the pitch and I'm sure they'll know even. And I thought, well, what if we get Jimmy Johnson as part of the campaign? But a figurehead, people mm-hmm. then fall in. So I phoned the sun and uh, spoke to the journalist concerned and he gave me Jimmy Johnson's number. You seem to have an hacker getting people's numbers, Jim. I've not used yet. No. Little did I know, in actual fact, his number's in the phone book. <laughs> Jimmy Johnson's number's in the phone book. Of course, Fear Park. So, uh, so it was a Friday afternoon and I phoned the number and he was out and I spoke to his son and I just said, Jim, will save ourselves. Uh, can you get your dad to give us a call? Just, we quick, just a wee quick chat with some ideas I have. So, next morning, Saturday morning, half nine, phone goes and it's a Saturday morning so you're still a bit disoriented with stuff. And, uh, I speak to Jim, well, I, who is it? It's Jimmy Johnson. And you're thinking, nah, and that. Yeah. So long story short, told them what we're trying to do, and then Jinky says, "Well, why don't we meet this week in my local, whatever it was, Oddingston?" Oh, aye, that'd be, that'd be good. I'd, up to that point, I'd never spoken to a Celtic player. 
never met a Celtic player. I'm not in supporters club. I don't go to supporters functions. I go to the game and back up the road. That's it. But I'm on the phone to Jimmy Johnson. And I'm going to see him on the Tuesday nights. I phone the other guys. We want to come. We want to come. So Willie Wilson couldn't come because he was in back shift. The other guys came and we meet Jimmy Johnson and we, and we tell him what we're trying to do. But basically, it wasn't that great a meeting and it wasn't really for him and it kind of fizzled out. But the fact that I mean, I ended up taking Jimmy Johnson home, another claim to fame, I gave Jimmy Johnson a love. So if we'd have got him, that might have done some, just to be a figurehead or, Jim, mm -hmm. or jinkies behind us. But that didn't happen. And then what well, the plan was, let's have another meeting and let's get Terry Cassidy along. But that was easier said than done because he was quite scathing in the Celtic view. Uh, albeit, when we had the meeting the first time, uh, the following week Celtic view, Tom Grant was in, the, was in the front page saying, it was a really good meeting and these are genuine fans and we should listen to what they're saying. So that was a bit of a cue to the fact that it made the front page of the Celtic view. Despite the fact that uh, Chris White is saying the opposite, he's saying you'll, you'll embarrass yourself. So they were obviously divided in, in, in what they thought of things because when when... when Dempsey was on the board, he had a cohort who were behind him and, and Kelly White against him. And White's the major shareholder. He's the major power broker in there. And to be fair, I mean, Rob Royston had, uh, I mean, it wasn't a guaranteed, you know, it was it was definitely going to happen. There were pitfalls and planning permission. And I think the Kelly White axis felt it was too risky. But anything was going to be too risky. If you're going to go out and spend you know, tens of millions of pounds building a stadium, there are risks inherent in that. And we'll come to Canvas Lang soon. Yeah. And uh, so we're trying to get Terry Cassidy, but he was really dismissive. And any correspondence we had, he was dismissive, 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 and wasn't interested. And then, cut long story short, we eventually get him to come to a meeting, and it's December uh, this time, and that's one of the wee cards he got there. Yeah. Uh, exhibit B, my lord. Got it. And uh, this time, we decide we'll make it a QA because Terry's coming, and Terry's been in post now for about a year. So we don't expect him to give us all the answers. We don't expect him to be solved in that meeting. But he's coming along. So this is good chance. So who else do we get for the panel? Willie's going to speak again, which is great. Brendan O'Hara agreed to chair it. So we've got a chair this time. And I, uh, Peter Rafferty, who was the head of the affiliation, agreed to come along, which was a coup because basically what we were kind of saying is what is the affiliation doing? And what is the association doing? Not a lot as far as we could see because at that time... The perception was it was about getting tickets for these old ticket games. Mm. You know, if it was a European game, they got their tickets. If it was a, a cup final, it was a game at Ibrox, they're getting the tickets. So were they doing anything in terms of, you know, I'm saying Morris Johnson, mm, Brian Dempsey get off the board, they'll win 35 in a row if you don't watch this. What are you doing over it? Nothing. So Peter Rafferty came along, so that was a bit of a cue as well. And again, I saw an, an article and a, a letters in the Herald again from a guy called Professor Tom Cabri, who seemed to be some sort of expert in the football stadium, how they were built, how they were financed, stuff. Phoned him up via the Herald again, and they gave me his number, and I went to see him, and I said, look, this is what it's about. You find me on the panel? So he came along as well. So that's the panel, but, but Cassidy's the draw. Mm -hmm. Everyone's coming to see Cassidy. And uh, he's a bit of a pantomime villain, and he couldn't answer all the questions, understandably so. And... The big takeaway was the fact that we had to build this all-seated stadium. And you get posed that question. About, I mean, there's all, lots of questions about, uh, are you going to do your best to keep Paul McStay? Because at that point, like Paul McStay was going to leave and other things. But, but the big question was the stadium. And the answer to the question that he gave is was that, uh, and this was like December 1991, and the deadline's August 94. And he said that not only uh, by August 1994 will we have the best stadium in the Britain will have the best stadium in Europe. And you're thinking, that's just... You know, and that's manna to the media. What was he saying about the, the light in the goalie's eyes with the NHL? I didn't know that, but you know, that was mine. That was mine. That, <laughs> nobody can share that. That's mine. So, like the karate kid, it's like, you know, wax on, wax off. Anyway, so sorry. Uh, so Terry comes along and that's what he says. And again, the media are all over it. That's the headline. That's the back page news and front page news and some of the tabloids and the Herald and so on Scotland today, et cetera, et cetera. But at no point did we ever get more than about 350, 400 people who were interested in doing something. And it kind of fizzled out after that because we kind of felt as if, well, we've had a couple of meetings here, people have came along. We, we wanted to form something called an independent Celtic supporters club, mm -hmm. but the idea being that not everyone are in supporters clubs. And so if you're a season ticket holder, for example, 
and you're not a sports club, who's actually talking yeah. for you? And what actually happened was the previous summer, uh, as I said, I had a, had a season ticket uh, for the stand. Uh, I gave up my season ticket. This was my boycott. This was my pebble in the ocean. That I'm not going back to Celtic Park until they're gone. And I didn't go and watch Celtic from May 91 until Fergus took over. I went a few away games from time to time. I went to Hamden now and again. But I never went to see Celtic at that point in time. And doing the research for the play <laughs> was quite illuminating because one of the kind of funny things, I went to a play called Ben and Bertie, Bertie Old, and, and then his sons came along to all the showings and his best pal was Pat McGinley, yeah. who hasn't changed in all that time. Can you speak to Pat? I'll speak to you separately about that. And I was saying to Pat, I said, and and I couldn't say to Pat because I'd never seen Pat McGinley play in a Celtic shirt. You know, and I felt kind of, I felt kind of bad. I bet, well, this Pat McGinley, how are you doing, Pat? Oh, you're a good... I had nothing to say to him because he never played for Celtic. So I never saw a game under Liam Brady because in order for things to change, people had to stop going. You had to boycott. You wouldn't say that in the first couple of months of this campaign mm. because, rightly so, who were you to tell people not to go to Celtic? Because as I alluded to earlier with Brian Dempsey talking about Celtic as the centre of your world, mm -hmm. you know, people won't work Monday to Friday and the big thing in their life is going to watch Celtic at the weekend. And if you say to somebody, by the way, you shouldn't go, you'll get slaughtered, and rightly so. So you should never say that. But that was the only way that things would change, because at the end of the day, if you're Chris White and you're Michael Kelly, you can shout and ball at them all you want. But if you're giving them, you know, your, your money on a Saturday or a Wednesday night, they've got no incentive to go whatsoever. And all they've got to do is kind of try and balance the book, try and try and limp on, try and keep some sort of existence. And they we're going to end up like Hibs, basically, pick a team in Scotland, we'll be like Hibs, because of the background of Hibs, we will, f we will be insignificant. Uh, so, uh, there's, there's no great appetite. We were literally there too soon. As I said earlier, that because you've got an opinion on something, it doesn't necessarily mean it's someone else's opinion. And you know at the start, well, unless people stop going, Nothing's going to change here. Nothing will change. And also the fact that we talked about, you know, you'd never ask for a boycott. There was a kind of unofficial boycott happening as the attendances went down and down and down to somewhere between twenty to 30,000. It's the average crowd. I mean, nowadays, obviously, we get 60,000 every game. Back then, you may get 60,000 for a game against Rangers, but most of the games, 20, 30,000. And in those seasons, once the league is finished, once you get to to March and you're like 12 points behind then people didn't go to games then and attendance has plummeted so from a cash point of view they're not getting much money in for mm. that and that's making life more difficult and that's making us find it more difficult to sign players and then I mean you could talk about the decisions of who they should hire they're bringing in Liam Brady never managed a team in his life and spending two and a half million just later we don't have the money and you're spending two and a half million pounds so there was a lot of things out with the whole conversation about who's on the board, about how the actual club was run at the time. And that's personal opinion, of course, the Stuart Slaters and the Andy Paytons and the Gillespies and the Cascarinos of this world and bringing Lee and Brady in. And we have, we have no money. And the board are thinking, well, if we spend money, then we'll win. You have no money to start off with. So what then happens over the course of a number of, maybe three years, that two million overdraft I mentioned earlier becomes five guts of six million pound when you get to 94. But I've jumped on a wee bit there. So... So it kind of fizzles out because we've kind of done a bit, uh, not to the extent that Celts for Change did. I mean, they were just it's brilliant in some of the stuff that Matt and the guys were doing. We didn't do that kind of stuff. It was a kind of gentle persuasion. Look, things need to change. People need to do something. How about doing something? And the fanzine is not the view once a term. We're really good to us. I mean, if we did anything, they'd stick it in the, in the fanzines. That, this is something I'd like to pick up on. So... The fanzines, yes, we'll do that first, and then also the affiliation and the association. I'm puzzled as to, as to where they were at. There's, there's a suggestion that some of the folks involved, I'm, I'm not saying Peter Rafferty or otherwise, I don't know his story, but that some folks were pretty comfy. They were, you know, they were getting their seats for cup finals, you know, not that we got too many at that time and, and some yeah. different things. But let's start with the fanzines. You, you've spoken about Jerry Dunbar from Not The View uh, a few times, and rightly so. Um, I remember it all too fondly in the, in the various kind of cartoons and just clever commentary on what was going on at the time um, 
they've obviously played a part, as has Matt's fanzine, which is once a Tim, always a Tim. Yeah. How pivotal were they in getting initial support? I think, did they have an ad in, in Not The View at one point before your first meeting, for example? They were huge. Uh, Not The View was just, just unbelievable at the time. Uh, because, I, again, it's maybe harder, again, for younger fans to realise how little information is kicking about. I always remember, as a wee example, when, when Radio Clyde came on the scene and started to cover football, this was like, Unbelievable! A phone in, you could phone in somebody and talk about football, and it's on the radio. And I remember there was a, a Celtic Rangers game in the late seventies, and after the game, they interviewed I think it was Joe Craig and Colin Jackson, and you'd never heard these guys speak before. Mm -hmm. So you think, well, that's what Joe Craig sounds like. So and nowadays, obviously, players are interviewed all the time. So the fanzines, what you had before that was basically the Celtic View. It's a very kind of sanitised uh, publication. Uh, nothing would be in the Celtic View that would be anti the board. And all of a sudden you have this kind of street punk type magazine that comes out, uh, I think it was September 87, and it's having a dig at the board. And it's also telling you some things that, you don't know if it's true, but if it's true you think, what? I can't believe that. Because what happened in the previous season, uh, for those who don't know, Rangers get fed up, I've been, I've been playing second fiddle, and they had this phenomenal stadium and, and a duff team, and decided that they were going to go all in and spend a bit of money and bring in Sunis. And as soon as his first season he goes out and buys England internationals like Butcher and Woods and Graham Roberts and, and etc. But in that season at one point we were nine points clear of the Sunis team. Nine points clear. And Davy Hay goes to the board and says, I want to sign Joe McLaughlin for Morton and Stevie Clark for St Mirren. But the fans need showed up we'll win this league. To which he was told by the board, if you want to sign those players, spend your own money. And we're going to lose the league. And that was soon as his first, we've won the league. This is paying off. The board give Davy here a bit of money, we win the league. And maybe soon as gets killed off before he even starts. Mm -hmm. We're no very enthusiastic, no, not too confident about the next season, but Billy McNeil comes back and it's one of these kind of fantasy seasons where you win the double in the centenary season with no right to win that particular league in that particular season. But the board do spend a bit of money. They do back Billy. They bring McEvaney and they bring Joe Miller in. And they bought Mike McCarthy as well, one or two others. Billy Stark. Billy Stark. For not a lot of money, 80 grand or something from Billy Stark. But Billy McNeil mean, galvanise everything and we win the league. And you think, kick on from there. But after winning the league, we sign no one. And across the city, they're signing, spending silly money again. Trevor, Stephen, Gary, Steve, people like that. And we're starting to get left behind. And by the end of that season, that's when Mo Johnson happens as well. So at that point, you're thinking... We are out of our depth. We will forever be in their shadow. We are stuffed. Something has to happen. So, what point am I at now? Uh, the fanzines, sorry. Yeah, so you're reading this stuff in the fanzines. And yeah, a lot of it is kind of uh, very funny and there's cartoons, whatever. But there's people saying, you know, this is what's happening in the background. And things like who owned the shares, I mean, that was getting talked about. You know, Chris Waits, the major shareholder. And then I was able to get uh, a copy of the share register as well which was fascinating reading, you know, you're seeing these, these, these names of people and there wasn't a lot of shares there, mm -hmm. you know, and that kind of leads to the David Lowe yeah. bit next, whereby once you get to 1990 and sorry, I'm finishing the fanzines, not if you still going to this day, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know how many, two, three hundred uh, editions. I, I couldn't believe it. Unbelievable yeah. stuff. Uh, in this world that we're in just now, which is pretty much, you know, digital, it's still going uh, and that's kudos to, you know, uh, Jed and Barb, Joe Miller, George of the Jungle and all these guys back then. So that was revolutionary. Uh, lots of people bought it. It got people thinking. Uh, and when the when the Save Our Celts then started, they were really supportive because basically we were singing the same song as they were singing. So they would put stuff in the fanzine all the time. The next meeting is then. We're thinking about doing this. They think like the red card protest. You know, went to Ibrox because... Uh, they had two or three players get sent off previous game and we're all up red cars and Margaret Thatcher Cup final. So they had lots of wee ideas as well. So you can never underestimate how, how good... And I suppose Not The View gave us a bit of kind of, well, if, if you can do Not The View, maybe we should do something as well. And maybe what Save Ourselves, and certainly Selfs for Change did, was maybe take the Not The View idea a wee step further and put it into the public domain. That you're not just selling uh, fanzines, you're actually going to the papers and you're going to uh, ex sales and ex-directors and saying, look, What's happening now? Can we kind of uh, keep this in the public eye? So it, it, it kind of fizzled out in about March 92. Uh, and I think it was not the view. Somebody's written in about uh, save yourself, should be doing this and doing that. 
And by that point, it kind of fizzled out. And I did a, I wrote a two-page kind of article that was in uh, Not The View. And and the punchline to the article was basically, like, if you want to change something, do something. Don't just talk about it. And, and what does that mean in real terms? Well, maybe you can't change anything. But tell people, write to the board. You know, is it, is it, is it too much hassle to buy a stamp? To buy a stamp to save Celtic? Because there's not much point howling at the moon. And that's what we were most fans like me were doing you write to the papers who cares you phone in Radio Clyde who cares and people are still phoning Radio Clyde to this day for some bizarre reason but you phone Radio Clyde what's the point in doing that so basically from a from a, from a fan point of view unless you boycott an organised boycott starving with the money waking up the bank to this nothing's going to happen so then what you hear on the grapevine via the fanzines that in the background uh David Lowe, who I'd never heard of before, uh, he's got an idea. Basically, he's got that share register as well. And he's kind of secretly in the background uh, uh, hoovering up shares with the plan being that if he can get 50% of the shares, outvote the board. What an idea. Brilliant. And I think that was with Brian Dempsey. I think Brian Dempsey still... John Keane was huge in that. John, so John Keane. Keane. So you've got guys like John Keane. And I think, as I said earlier, I think Brian Dempsey is the constant with us. Uh, he's the one that's you know making making sure something's happening all the time, mm -hmm. and that's why I think he deserves lots of praise. Uh, so he's doing that, and then you find it maybe ninety two, the sh shares are getting bought up, and then the board get wind of it, and then they form this this pact, which makes it extremely difficult, and there was lots of toing and froing. So this this share issue or the issue with the shares looks like it's a dead duck, even though. They're calling EGMs and they're making it uncomfortable. But at the end of the day, that's going to be a dead end. Then you get back to the stadium issue. What's happened with the stadium? Well, really nothing. And they've come up with this idea of canvas line. It's going to be like a two-sided stadium. It's, it's built in a ground that's got toxic waste on it. It's just, you name it, it's got it. It's, mm -hmm. it's got something bad about it. And it was never going to happen... There was a couple of TV programmes about it and the person behind it had, you know, uh, a kind of suspect past. And just, it was just, it was just nonsense. So, by this point, you know, 93, they've done, what, four in a row by this point in time? Uh, and as I said, it's, it, it's as many as you want, basically. And then you get to the point whereby the bank are getting twitchy. Uh, and if we wrapped up maybe March 92... I think it was the end of 93, I think uh, a guy called Brendan Sweeney, who was a pal of Willie Wilson's, I think he spoke to Willie and Brendan put him in touch, or Willie put him in touch with Mark McGloan, and I think that's when Celtics for Change were formed, when about the <clears throat> October, November 93. And they were brilliant, they were just brilliant. Some of the stunts they pulled were just, the one about the Bank of Scotland, they all kind of marked the Bank of Scotland, they were going to open up accounts and then shut them next day. I mean, that takes... That takes some guts. Really, that takes some, some guts. And all the placards about Fergus McAfee isn't your friend. It's just, just brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And uh, in the back, the team sacked the board, you know, and they're on the terrace and they've got their T-shirts on. And I was always fascinated by that. I've got a wee bit of that in the play, thinking who's who's wearing the letters? I want B, I want S. I've got yeah. a blank T-shirt. I'm in the middle. I'm, I'm a bit between back and sack, you know. So, so they do all these stunts. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And then you fast forward to something like the, the February, and by that time, I think they'd canvassed quite a lot of opinions from supporters clubs, put it on Ireland, and they're going to go for a boycott. Eventually, they're going to go for a boycott. And, and they're not telling people boycott. They're saying, look, if you could, that'd be good, you know. And that's the kind of thing that, that we could never have asked people after a couple of months. But even... Y y I know what you're saying there in terms of you guys and what you were doing. It was too soon to ask that question. It was too radical a move. And as you say, you know, going to the game was one of the kind of, or certainly for some folk, maybe the only, you know, good Absolutely. thing to look forward to in the week and you can understand yeah. that, that emotion. But Matt has said the same, you know, sitting in the very same chair, Jim, he was talking about the fact that when they came around, say it was October 93, it was too soon. People didn't know who they were, certainly didn't know if they could trust them, didn't know what their angle was, all that kind of stuff. And there was calls early on in Celts for Change. I nearly confused my supporters groups there, but Celts for Change. Right, right, there was right. calls early on for a boycott. And I think Matt and others were quite strong on saying it's not the right time. It'll fall flat. That just shows support. you. I mean, that just shows you that, that, that late 1993, 
They've won 89, 90, 91, 92. They've won five in a row. <laughs> too soon. Mm. <laughs> it's too soon for a boycott. They've done five in a row. You know, and I understand that, that, you know, they're just on the scene. So who are you? Matt McGlowan, Brendan Sweeney, who are sales for change? We don't trust you. And that's understandable because that's how people think. And that's why it'd be impossible in this day and age because you'd be slaughtered on social media as soon mm. as you put someone up there. Who are you? So I could understand that. And it was, you know, Actually, even to do any kind of boycott was superb. And then, uh, sorry, on you. you I was just going to ask about, so obviously that's a time where fans are on the fence to an extent. What do we do? Do we go with this boycott? Do we do we still go and enjoy the games? You know, Are we going to get pilloried for going to the games? All these kind of yep. things. Is this not where your affiliation and your association of Celtic supporters clubs should have stepped in or, or even before that? To absolutely, Tino. You know, absolutely. That's why when... You know, we were looked at as a bunch of idiots, basically. I mean, in fact, somebody just said to us, well, what is it you guys are about? What is he trying to do? And, and, but they didn't want to talk. I don't think they wanted to talk to Celtics for change. I, don't, I, don't, I think they're, they're quite... The thing was, they were quite comfy, quite cosy in a club that could potentially die. And if it doesn't die, it's going to limp on for a number of years. And if they were into the bank for the got of five or six million quid... Now, again, points of view. I can sit back and say, well, you've no future... If I'm them, I'll say, well, we'll sell Paul McStay mm. and we'll get three million quid. We'll give that to the bank. That'll keep them sweet for a year or so. And then we'll, send, we'll sell John Collins. That was before Bosman. We can, sell, we can sell Pat Bonner. That's how we'll survive. And I also think that, again, different sides of the table. If I'm a Kelly or a White, maybe I would think the same as you're thinking. Mm. Because basically, you said there that people look forward to it. It's maybe the only thing they have in their life. If I'm Michael Kelly, Kevin Kelly... Uh, Chris White this is the biggest thing in my life I can trace my lineage back to the formation of Celtic nobody's taking this club from me mm -hmm. I'd rather see it die than that so that's the mentality and you could kind of understand the mentality but I think if they'd have just uh, bent a bit if they'd have bent a bit and just kind of said you know what we'll give up some of our power here we'll bring our own entrepreneurs we'll give Dempsey's head whatever if they'd done that they'd still be there do, do you think it's clear Jimmy that it was a board divided so you've got your, your Kellys your Whites and, and others David Smith I believe is a guy who was digging his heels in but then you've got Tom Grant and uh, Jim Farrell Jimmy Farrell who, yep. who, who come along to your meeting by all accounts pretty gregarious guys you know yep. decent minded guys but were they just caught in the crossfire you know there's no doubt you said it earlier on the piece Jim all these guys on the board they're Celtic fanatics in, in different right. you know, shapes and forms. Yeah. But do you think it was just clear there was so much division in terms of one group wanting to go one way, one wanting to dig their heels in? You know, you think there was guys like Tom Grant, for example, heavily compromised by all accounts? I think uh, they're in a situation that they weren't used to. How, how, do you, how do you deal with that situation? Go and build a new stadium. You need to find tens of millions. But what? Tens of millions of pounds. Mm. You owe the bank the guts of five or six million, pay them back. What? what? Well, they're not used to dealing with that. They're not qualified to deal with that. They're not skilled to deal with that. These weren't, these weren't rich men. These weren't entrepreneurs. They were fish out of water. And they're in the public gaze as well. And that's why I said the stadium, Hillsborough, the tail of the port, that's the game changer. Mm -hmm. Because it's one thing selling Paul makes day and showing up the finances, but you need to build a stadium and we're getting close to 1994. And if you don't build that stadium, you're stuffed. Because UEFA brought in something similar as well. So we're going to be playing to crowds of like 10,000 or yeah. whatever. And that will be, you know, self-perpetuating. If you're playing to crowds like, like Hibs, you know, so you end up playing to similar size of crowds, you've got similar size of finances, and across the road, they've left you for dust. And the Champions League started, the new Champions League came in in 1992, I think. They'll qualify that forever. And they will win 35 in a row. Not a problem. So that focused minds. Then the boycott happened and the bank got twitchy at that point. So you always have got a six million quid. Give us some money. We're not going for getting this back. I think the bank has spoken to them a number of times over a number of years and they wanted personal guarantees from them. And where Fergus came into this, uh, I mean, I think Fergus had approached the board in the late 80s offering them interest-free loans and all sorts of stuff and they chased Fergus a number of times. And in fact, during that 1991 campaign, I got a phone call from Fergus at the Blue and just straight away, it's like, uh, who are you? What's your campaign about? What do you hope to achieve? Uh, 
who are you? <laughs> I've never heard of Fergus McCann. Who are you? He said, well, I'm putting this business consultant together. I'm doing this and the other. Who are you? Back to me. I said, well, I had this bubble meeting and Brian Dempsey. And he was a fan of Brian Dempsey. Mm-hmm. Because I think at the start, Brian and Fergus were, were kind of okay. But when they got to the end, there was a, there was a huge, huge yeah. rift that, you know, they, they couldn't stand each other, basically. It's a shame that because you've mentioned that Brian Dempsey is a constant throughout, you know, I suppose from being removed from the board. What was that, the end of 1990 or 91 when he was removed? October 1990. 90. Yeah. So he's removed, but he's then, I think he was keen to make sure it wasn't deemed as a, a revenge mission. You know, he yeah. knew how it would look in the press that, you know, spurned ex-director aye, aye. Back, back to to fight the good fight and stuff like Absolutely. that. But he's obviously played his huge part, including, you know, stepping up in the, the Chittleson Town Hall for you guys and, and various bits beyond that. And he's on the steps and he says the famous sta- statement that, you know, we've all repeated, the game is over, the Rebels have won. Mm-hmm. And it then just drifts, you know, him and Fergus clearly can't see eye to eye at that point and it moves mm-hmm. on. But to take it back to, to save ourselves, Jim, you know, as we start to get closer to the, the end of the piece here, mm-hmm. you know, you've mentioned that Brendan Sweeney is introduced via Willie from, from Save Ourselves to Matt McGlone to form Celts for Change. Celts for Change then through a, a variety of publicity stunts and, and you know, fan yeah. support. Yeah. They really instigate that change and pave the way for Fergus and others to, to make their moves. And I don't think it's too dramatic, Jim, to say that without Save Our Celts, you don't get Celts for Change. And without Celts for Change, you don't get the move of Fergus. So I'm not not fluffing this up because you're in the room, but would you agree with that statement? Do you think it would have come about regardless? It would have come about regardless. I mean... <laughs> Everything comes down to money at the end of the day and, and the money had run out and the bank were twitchy and I think that boycott of that game made them sit up and say, hold on, uh, they get, they get 8,000 people through the gates that night. Uh, we'll never get our money back. We'll never get our money back. We want our money back. We want a million pounds now or else we're shutting up shop. And, and that's what kind of pushed things over the edge at that point in time. So so the boycott had its effect. Uh, I, when I, you know, people will ask the question to save ourselves. Uh, it was there for a year and it kept things in the public eye. It was too soon to make any significant change. It never had uh, enough support because, again, you didn't know what that was going to entail. If you hand out 5,000 leaflets and 4,000 people get back to you, you think, oh, God, this is... <laughs> You know, not that you would know how to deal with that because you've never done something like this before mm-hmm. but if you had thousands of people coming back to you and you thought okay we could form this independent supporters club now because I think at the time maybe the affiliation maybe had maybe, maybe 10,000 people and maybe the association 7,000 numbers of that kind of if we'd managed to form this independent club and had thousands of people then maybe through that something might have happened but that's, that didn't happen mm. so it's pretty much kind of a, we annoyed Terry Cassidy a bit and we annoyed the board a bit and it kept it in the public eye for the best part of a year and it kept people talking about it and beyond that I don't think it achieved very much and I think things would have changed anyway and I admired Matt and Brendan and the guys and what they've done was just amazing but maybe even if a search for change hadn't happened the money's going to run out at some point at some point the bank are going to say we, and I'm surprised that the bank left it as long as they left it because mm-hmm. if you owed money and Banks tend to deal with people rather than companies. Do you trust the person there? And the banks seem to trust David Murray because he runs a number of companies, he can, he can back this. You would never trust the people on the Celtic board as individuals. Mm-hmm. And if I was owed £2 million for these guys, I'd want my money back as soon as possible. It becomes three, it becomes four, it becomes five. At what point do you say, what's my tipping point here? I want my money back. And I think that would have happened at some point. I think Sales for Change brought it forward a wee bit. And and we managed to stop the ten, just, which was good. Just that's another play. Just <laughs> stop the ten, and if if it had happened maybe two or three years earlier, they wouldn't have got to the nine. Mm. Not that that should be a big thing, nines and tens. And Fergus was interested in that. No. He was. I'm not interested in these these, these numbers. I'm putting the, the, the club on a, a firm financial footing, and he put these plans to the uh, to the, to the fans in 90, 92 or ninety three. He'd say, look, this is what I want to do. I want to raise X million pounds. I'm going to put, and it was the guts of nine million pounds. There's money into this. Uh, we'll get some bank borrowings. We're going to build a 60,000 stadium. And people thought, what? Just 60,000? Are you off your head? Because basically, the average crowds were between 20 and 30,000, you know. And it was actually, I think, 89 was when the film Field of Dreams came out. If you build it, they will come. Yeah. 
and Fergus used that phrase that they will come but nobody and I mean nobody could have envisaged a 60,000 Celtic Park where virtually they're all season ticket holders you could never ever envisage and there's a waiting list you could never envisage that because back in the day as I said earlier it was all cash you just turn up and you pay your way and if there's a 60,000 stadium then why do you need a season ticket? It'll mm. never be sold out so I'll just pay at the gate but it just shows you, and I know it's an obvious statement to make now, but it shows you the vision that Fergus McCann had that the Kellys and the Whites just couldn't possibly have. It just wasn't within their gift to, to think like that. And there was lots of derogatory comments made by the Kellys and the Whites to say that will never happen. And, but I think most fans secretly thought that will never <laughs> happen. So he was a visionary. I mean, he had his faults. Uh, like everyone has their faults. And he divides the support at the end of the day because yeah. do you think he still divides them I know he did and obviously there's a, the infamous boon when he raised the flag on on flag day you know after stopping the 10 do you not think now he's 99% you know respected I think, I think if you'd social media back then that, that wouldn't have happened I think yeah. what people are depending on are the newspapers mm -hmm. and they're painting him like Saddam Hussein and what have you and they're, yeah. they're picking up all this stuff and obviously we'd, we'd, we'd lost Wim Janssen and there was faults on both sides you know and Fergus said pretty early on, this is the fans' money. I'll look after it. And he did everything he said he would do. Now, you don't have to like him for that. And I think at the time, he was investing nine. And I think he said something like, if I make a million, that's fine. I'll do that. And he walked away with about 40 million. Yeah, <laughs> you know, right. and, and people, and then he was saying to people, well, do you want me to lose money? Because basically, if you bought shares at the same time, then your investment is worth the same as mine is. He done what he said he would do. Aye. And nobody can fault him for that, absolutely. Yeah. Um, just just as you were saying there, Jim, so obviously, um, Willie put an article out, Willie Wilson, around about 2011, I think I read it um, just in the last right. couple of days. He's quoted as saying, similar to what you indicated, that he believed that the Save Our Sales group had arrived probably just a wee bit too soon for some supporters to, to embrace radical change. And I think, generally speaking, you, you agree with that. Um, I think there's huge credit due to you guys for what you've done and I know you're a pretty modest guy Jim and you're, and you're happy to play that down and that's that's absolutely fine but let's take it to just you as a person Jim or the Celtic fan not okay. Jim or of, of Save Our Celts I've spoken about Brian Dempsey on the steps making that announcement you know the, the famous quote how do you feel at that point Jim so whether you are part of a, a supporters group or not at that point you're just a fan like everybody else how do you feel when you realise that Celtic are all of a sudden moving forward into a new era Personally, I'll go back to the games now. So that's me going back. But so that um, was you right up until then? You hadn't gone to a game? No, not, not at Celtic Park. Uh, and I lost my brilliant season ticket. <laughs> and then when we went back to Celtic Park, I was in the North Stand Up in the Gods. Uh, so from a personal point of view, I'm going to go back to the games now. I knew it'd be a hard slog. I knew that he, he couldn't come in and mag wave a magic wand. That was never going to happen. Uh, he was looking after the pennies. He had a stadium to build. He had enormous pressure on him. He's getting advice from here, there and everywhere. He's bringing in his own guys to do a thorough audit after the event. I mean, if you're going to buy something, you do that before the event. He's bringing in guys <laughs> yeah. and they're finding stuff under the carpets and what have you. So he had to sort all that stuff. He ended up having to pay the board money, which he didn't want to do. Uh, so it was going to be a, a kind of tough, tough time. Uh, he brings in Tommy Burns a few months later, which I think the fans unanimously wanted Tommy Burns. We play at Hamden and they're awful on the park dreadful and you're thinking well is this a good idea with Tommy Burns uh, next season great season lost one game and still managed to lose and then the pressure ramps up because of the nine in a row and he's not bothered he's saying look you know mm -hmm. and he was right because the whole point of the 60,000 is that 10 at least 10 maybe at the time it's maybe 15,000 more than Ibrox and we've got that advantage straight away and that's why what's happened in the past 20 odd years has happened because we've got a big financial advantage uh, and that was Fergus McCann and that was his vision and you can't argue with that. Uh, if it wasn't Fergus that took over, I think there were other Celtic-minded people out there, uh, the Willie Hockeys of this world. So I think somebody, or somebody from, you know, be coming from left field from the States or somebody would come in and maybe have bought the club. So whether they'd have the vision to build the 60,000 stadium, I'm, I don't know. I don't know how that would work out. From a personal point of view, uh, it was good to stop moaning uh, and to see some sort of future that we thought, you know, they've got a chance here. But across the city, they were they were massive. They were absolutely massive. And how do you claw that? And I, I still felt this will take a long, long time uh, to try and claw back. And then, as history will tell you, they end up getting out of business and we're still here. And I know they've come back in a different form. But uh, 
all the stuff that's happened over the last 20, 30 years, that's that's down to the vision of Fergus McCann. Absolutely. As I said, he has his faults. Uh, and well. he could have maybe done, done some things a bit better. And the whole kind of the Canio and Cadetti and Van Hoy. Also. Again, you're reading stuff in the papers. You know, and I've seen quotes since that from people at Van Hoy. So that's not what happened. What happened was, was this. And the interesting thing about, just going back to the Terry Cassidy uh, thing at Shelton Town Hall, people say, well, We've heard such and such a thing and Cassie would say, well, where did you hear that? Mm. It was in the record. Well, you tell me the record's factual and then, so he would shut people down on that and you're thinking, ah, oh, you're right. <laughs> Cause, cause be, because we've read it in the paper, actually, and if the papers did have some sort of anti-Celtic agenda, then it's no fact. So I could see myself being these, a guy in the audience saying, what about this? And then realising, oh, you're right. It was in the record. So maybe it isn't he? factual at all and Cassidy walked in and one of the first things he said was that uh, everywhere I've looked needs attention and he brought in Peter Law was his financial controller there was no financial systems so it was a shambles so Cassidy took over a shambles they get rid of Cassidy a couple of years later and then Fergus comes in and he hits a shambles as well so I think there was a lot of work to be done to get us up to this kind of like level build a stadium have the share issue I mean he's juggling so many things at the same time. He's in the public eye and he's not somebody who's used to being in the public eye and doesn't like it and doesn't cope with it particularly well and the media love that mm -hmm. and they compare him to to David Murray. So he's the golden boy and Fergus is this, you know, Saddam Hussein, we kind of guy and the point you made earlier that if it was now and he was on the park and he was doing that, then you're talking about 99% of the fans are going to applaud him because we, I mean, even with all the knowledge that we have, we don't know the half of it. Mm -hmm. in terms of the stuff that he had to do behind the scenes and all the grief that he had and all the stuff in his period. He, he, he married a couple of years later and he's had kids. And you tend to forget all that kind of stuff because all you see is you're in charge of Celtic. We need to win the league. What are you doing about it? And uh, yeah, so huge admiration for, for Fergus McCann. Uh, and that's why, you know, as we speak, we're a couple of points behind the league and it's 50-50 now. And I don't get too down in these things now because you've, You've lived through that either that the club could have went bust, there could be no Celtic, you know. And over the last years, albeit European makers are appalling, uh, domestically, you can't argue with that. I would, I know this has come up to the current day, uh, I would question the current board's uh, mentality in keeping 70 million quid in the bank. I just don't understand that at all. But hey ho, we are where we are in terms of this. But in terms of the context of this conversation, uh, yeah, Fergus, you can't. Uh, you can't argue against it. No, you can't. Um, Jim, final question. So obviously at the top of the piece, we talk about the fact that for you in terms of becoming active in this, it's 33 years. So we're celebrating this week, uh, week beginning 4th of March, 30 years to the day since Fergus took over. But for yourself, that journey started a few years prior. But just final question, what's your overall feelings now when you reflect on those times in your life? Uh, it was interesting, uh, is the word I would use. Uh, you ended up speaking to Jimmy Johnson and Brian Dempsey and, and Joe Boltrami and the Hugh Keevenses and the James Trainers. So that was a bit of an experience. My head was never above the parapet. So I'm sure if, he's, if, if it was Wally Wilson sitting here, he would say, well, pff, I'd never do that again uh, because it's just too much grief. But for me, the grief wasn't there. And in some ways, actually, it, it, it has kind of helped because uh, when I retired uh, five years ago, I started writing plays as a hobby and Celtic plays. And through being asked to come on podcasts and talk about Save Ourselves, People have got to know who I am and I did Bender like Brat back, I've done Bender like Bertie and they've done really, really well. So because I was known for this Save Yourself, that's got me noticed a bit. And if, if Save Yourself hadn't happened, maybe the plays wouldn't have been noticed as much. And as I said, but the plan was that I'd written this play and if you know the history, question mark, that was going to take place this week. That was the plan to celebrate the 30th anniversary. But we did Bender like Bertie at the Pavilion last year and they asked us back does he want to do it again in the same week so that was on last month so I couldn't do Bender and Bertie and then do this this play about the years leading up to the 30th to the uh, to the takeover in 94 the play's not about the takeover and it's not about Fergus it's about those seasons that in fact a lot of stuff we've talked about today it's about a family a Celtic supporting the family and what they're experiencing so so everyone makes an appearance you know Celts for change are in there somewhere save ourselves not at the view Cassidy, Dempsey, all that kind of stuff. And and it was a play I had to write because I kind of lived through it and I knew a lot of the stuff there, a lot of the detail stuff that's not in 
in any of the books that you can read. Uh, like the sun will never be in the goalkeeper's eyes, which is just my favourite Brian Dempsey phrase. So I'll maybe finish with that one. Yeah. So that's um, I've got the flyer here, Jim. So it's enough. You know the history. But what I'm keen to do, um, I said beforehand, is get yourself and Jerry from the play uh, on to chat like that. So it's going to be in October of this year. But we'll get to that. Yeah, a wee bit closer to times but in the meantime Super. Jim um, huge thanks for joining us here on the Celtic Exchange and, and just for sharing your story I also know that if I ever need somebody's phone number GTPR and all that kind of stuff regardless I'm your boy you, you're the guy I'm your for boy. that um, but thanks to yourself for all involved at that time through Save Our Celts and everyone you know for, for everything they've done during that time without it Jim we might not be sitting here talking about Celtic and that that wouldn't bear thinking about so thanks and all the very best cheers to you thank you